She's a 60 year female. Uh, she came to me in 2016 with bilateral knee pain, had a windswept deformity. She's a rheumatoid. And I told her to get the knees done. And she presented a few years later with this. And she has a history of uh, some surgery, plastic surgery, procedure done almost 25, 30 years ago. Uh, we don't have the details of that. Some kind of flap was done, and this is a skin condition during, before the surgery on the right side. So I think we can um, continue our discussion on the stress fractures and the right side. Sure, so you did a bone metabolic workup? Yeah, it, she had osteoporosis, a DEXA scan was bad, and uh, the ALP was raised. And was there any concern for infection given her history of a flap and everything else? That, no, no, because that was almost 20 years ago. I even consulted the plastic surgeon for the incision and used the same incision what was suggested by them. Okay. So should I show what I've done? Uh, the, the panel have any questions? Dr. Rajkapal, uh, how, how would you uh, tackle this? Um, so this extra-articular deformity is something that will conform to an intra-articular correction. Uh, I would use an offset stem to be able to position my tibial base plate. Otherwise, uh, otherwise I, it would be a fairly routine uh, TKR. Would do a slightly more extended lateral release, a sequential lateral release to be able to realign that uh, tibia onto the femur. What range of movements uh, did she have when she came to me, she came on a wheelchair because she had stopped uh, mobilizing a few days ago. Okay. I couldn't make her stand. So she was uh, otherwise a community ambulator. Before but that. her range of movements under anesthesia it's, it's was good. pretty good. It's good. Yeah. So that, that's what I would do. Okay. Anybody awesome. have anything to add? Just one comment. The fracture acute, it's still not united, right? Yeah, actually, she, they said for the past three, four days, she stopped three, mobilizing. Three, four days. Yes. So, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I think it is, it, is, it is a fresh fracture. So I'm sure you can correct it yeah, at yeah. the level of the other concern essentially which I would uh, want to have more information on is uh, the condition of the skin the scar if it is adherent down to the patellar tendon because the lateral view which is provided shows that she's got a lot of patella baha there so yes. I think an infrapatellar contracture is something else which I need to you know keep at the back of my mind probably need to look at some form of uh, patellar lengthening procedure uh, to be incorporated, if at all the need be. But of course, that is one concern, scar adherence and the position of the patella. Of course, the lateral view is deceptive because there's rotation that's inbuilt, so we need a good uh, lateral view under fluoroscopy. All right, Dr. Sharma, did you, did you do any of that? Uh, I think uh, I had another x-rays which are not here and okay. I could find out that the patella was almost okay. okay. And uh, so the, uh, how do we plan the exposure, the cuts, the releases and the implant choice. So this is uh, what I saw intraoperatively. There was hypertrophic uh, vastus medius obliquus and you can see the tendon is skewed. Um, it's going almost towards the lateral side and uh, I, I did it through this uh, incision what was suggested by the plastic surgeon and on opening up you can see huge osteophytes which were actually I couldn't find on the x-rays and that was a little strange for me and a huge defect on the lateral side which was obvious and uh, there was uh, some uh, bony osteophytes on the lateral side. I did a routine uh, um, total knee, uh, valgus knee, three degree valgus cut with the more bone being resected from the medial condyle. And uh, the, the issue was I had asked for an intramedullary cutting jig, but that was not sent on the table. I had to put in an intramedullary rod and used an extramedullary jig to do the cut. And then, you know, the other way would have been I would have plated the fracture uh, with a short uh, unicortical plate, reduced it, aligned it, and then do a uh, proximity bell cut. So I also checked the, for the reaming uh, with the C-arm and uh, obviously as Dr. Um, you know, Rajkupal was saying that you, your tibia plate might not be sitting in the center and you might need a, a stem, offset stem. Um, I had to almost please everything including the popliteus on the lateral side but I could, man, uh, could manage to do a straightforward knee with this long stem. So this was the immediate post-op and a three months follow-up. She did develop a skin complication uh, at that uh, 
if you can see that area where you know there is a triangular uh, scar and the, uh, the edge is matching and it was grafted um, but these are the results at three months any comments critique I think it looks good. I mean, I think I, I, you definitely have some Baja on that right side. Yes, little. And um, the key learning points were severe deformities and osteoporosis are prone to stress fractures and we must treat them in time and the patient should be subjected to a total knee if they have these deformities. Use intermittently tibial cutting jigs. Temporarily fix the fracture with a small plate if you're not able to align them, especially with the uh, non-unions and malunions where you might need to correct them. Stem extenders to bypass the defect and fluted stems with hybrid fixation. This is a beautiful classification and uh, algorithm given by Dr. Mulaji in General of Arthroplasty in 2010, which actually decides the treatment patterns which needs to be given for acute uh, non-union or a malunion of these stress fractures. Thank you. Yeah, I think the point being that with an acute fracture, it should be easier to uh, do set that, that fracture initially as opposed to more chronic ones. Well, well, great job. Excellent. Any comments from the panel? Nope. Great. Thank Look you. good. Thank you. Right. We have time for another case? Uh, sure. Is it one more case? I have another oh, you case. You have a case. Yeah, I, go ahead. I can present sure. more. Can we have the other one? So we had uh, some kind of discussion on stiff knees in the morning. Dr. Rajikpal was present, uh, moderating that session. So this is a case about total knee orthoplasty and ankylosed knee. Uh, and I've given a classification of ankylosed knees, so I wanted to discuss this case here. He's just a 20-year-old male. He's, he had tuberculosis almost 8 to 10 years ago and bony ankylosis in almost 60 degrees. With shortening, he wants a pain-free mobility. That's the x-rays preoperatively. All right, who wants to tackle this one? Raj Dr. Raj Gopal, go ahead. So, so what, what is the question here? What, do you, what should you do for it? Is that your question? Yes, sir. Replace it. Um, so you need to do, can you go back to the uh, x-ray? So here you have two areas of concern. One is the flexion contracture, ankylosis inflection between the femur and the tibia. The second concern, which is the more important concern, is your petala and your femur, right? So midline incision, you do a rectus snip, and this would be a case where you should get a CT scan preoperatively, because that's going to delineate your petalofemoral junction, and you would want to measure exactly roughly where your articulation is, and you take that uh, articulation, do an osteotomy with a wide rectus snip that gives you your exposure to that bony bar between the femur and the tibia. And so we've actually described this. So you take a incision which would be uh, approximately about 2.5 centimeters from the epicondylar axis, and then you t drop another cut just distal to that, which is roughly about another 12 to 14 millimeters, go almost up to the posterior edge or posterior cortex, not all the way through, and then you snap it, you flex it, you actually create an a osteoclasis sort of a thing, and then subperiosteally go all the way around and expose that. You, once you've got the articulation moving, you then go posteriorly and release the entire posterior capsule, the gastrocnemius, and then you start doing your femoral preparation or the tibial, whichever you believe in. The challenge here will always be trying to get extension back. So once you've got that, you've got your femoral size, then you start working on the tibia. And these are knees that at the end of your procedure, you will, if you get it down to about eight, 10 degrees of flexion, with the petal up tracking in the right place, and leave these patients postoperatively with seven, six, ten degrees of flexion. Yeah. You will, you will be good. They'll be stable. This patient, you can expect to get roughly about 70, 80 degrees of flexion postoperatively in the even children. And um, the other concern that you should have is neurovascular injury over here because this has been flexed to 60 degrees forever. So you want to put these into a dialogue brace, not get them out into full extension, 
Because like Dan said, you do that into full extension, you drop your lateral popliteal or you get a vascular challenge. So you need to be careful. At the end of your procedure, it's helpful to do a Doppler type study to make sure that your vascularity is intact and put them into gradual extension braces and have very graduated competent physiotherapy at the end of it. That would be my approach. Thank you. Okay, so that was a lot of advice. So what did you do? So um, what, was, what would be your implant of choice? I would like to know from the panel. What's your question? What's the implant? Oh, who's doing a PS? So I think the, you will need stem on either side. The, the problem with this, most of the fusion is that you get two pillars of strong bones. You can see it on the lateral view and same thing happens on the AP. The rest in the middle is all very hollow. And I think, I, I think you're not going to get a very good uh, strong um, purchase uh, just on the epiphysis. So I, I would, you would put a stem on either side, I would think. But PS otherwise, yes. Ashok, can I just ask you a question since you've done a bunch of these? What's your trick to figure out, got yeah, my foot. Um, <laughs> what's your trick to figure out um, the uh, trajectory of your first cut here? Are you queuing off the tibia or queuing off the femur? Um, tibia, I presume, so it right? It is the tibia. Yeah, that's what I thought you were going to say. So you're queuing off the tibia and you're trying to cut the tibia about where it normally would have been. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Interestingly enough, in a lot of these knees, by the time you've done your osteotomy and you've taken that wafer of biscuit of bone out from the middle, oftentimes in the intercontinental notch, you actually see the posterior cruciate. Yes, you, can find it. you can find it, and that tells you that you're at the right level. Yeah. And then from there on, you, know, you take graduated baby steps and work your way through. Wait, wait, it just wait. tells you that you're at the right joint line level. What happened, Dr. Sharma? Yeah, so this is the video of the patient preoperatively. This is how he used to walk. And um, he wanted a straight leg with mobility. And I promised him, we'll not discuss the theory, it's already been done. So I released the immediately, start immediately, osteotomized the patella. Lateral guttal was cleared. I did, a, I did not do a rectus snip, but I released what uh, Dr. Rajkapal described in the afternoon, that you just uh, erase it from the femur, distal femur. <coughs> In situ proximal tibial cut was taken after the distal femur cut and a biscuit of bone was removed. Uh, still there was a mismatch so I had to do more cuts and I did more distal femur cut and uh, revised the tibial cut as well but uh, I could not miss, uh, match the flexion and extension gap so I uh, resorted to as from Noyles prepared it and uh, ultimately I put in a sleeve and I did this. And as Dr. Rajkupal has already told, leave it in a little bit of flexion. That is what I did. Could able, was able to close the, uh, the quadriceps. And this is the post-op x-ray. And this is the follow-up x-ray, the alignment views. And these are his uh, results, the function. He's walking perfectly. He's got a government job. He's pretty happy with his function. And there's almost one or two year follow-ups of the same patient. And based upon this and a lot of other cases I've done, <coughs> I described a classification published in IGO um, on 61 cases of stiff knees where they were classified into type 1, type 2, type 3, depending upon the flexion and the fibrosis, whether it was fibrous ankylosis or a bony ankylosis, uh, what degree of flexion contractures they had. And uh, as the, uh, the classification increases, the degree of difficulty and the constraint of implants you need to use was also increasing in these. And uh, it's also been published in my book. Thank you.